All right, so hello and welcome. So my friends again at the Armchair Historian, they put out a video quite a while back, I think, about how the Soviets blitzed Japan in World War II and thought I'd react to it. So this is really, because most people, I don't know if they know that Russia, Soviet Union did declare war on Japan at the very end stages, like they said they would, which was basically 30 days from the fall of Germany, the Soviets were to declare war on Japan, which they did. Um, and it is a campaign that's not really covered, but, um, kind of one of the best showcases of what the Soviet military could do at the very end of the war. Um, so yeah, hopefully you'll get something out of this. Um, otherwise the original video is in the link in the description, go like it there. Otherwise let's get with it. Dust chokes the air of the cramped claustrophobic tunnel network beneath the city of Halar. The concrete walls tremble slightly with each artillery strike on the city above, raining yet more choking particulates on the hunched Japanese infantry. Trembling with exhaustion, the men clutch empty rifles or loose bayonets, their ammunition long spent. But despite their desperate situation, the fire of defiance still burns in their eyes, and the rumbling of tanks in the distance only fortifies their resolve to die a glorious death in the name of the Emperor. Though their continued resistance seems like madness, each man knows exactly what he needs to do. When they emerge from their holes, they will charge the enemy tanks directly, using rubble for cover. Those with bayonets will sacrifice themselves to distract the infantry, while the men carrying demolition charges will flank the Soviet armor. None will return, but their deaths will allow Helar to survive one more grim day. Yeah, so Soviets, again, were fighting a total war against Nazi Germany on the uh, Eastern Front, the Western Front for the Soviets. And now their actual Eastern Front for the Soviets, they're going to go fight another fanatical enemy. So, yee, I guess. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. Many viewers will be familiar with the island hopping campaign that the United States carried out against Japan for control of the Pacific Ocean. But the enormous Soviet push into Japanese-occupied Manchuria in 1945 remains remarkably obscure known sometimes as the August Storm. Yeah, so it's very obscure um, for Americans, really. Most Americans think the war ends with the atomic bomb, and it does for Japan. But they don't realize that the Soviets, one of the fucking main reasons the Jap Japanese were also surrendering was because, well, they're getting their shit rocked by the Soviet army in Manchuria. They didn't want to be occupied by communists, I'll tell you that, so. The Soviet offensive captured over a million miles of land in less than three weeks, a feat unequaled in military history. Yeah, that is unequaled. That's fucking insane if you really think about it. A million square miles is gone in three weeks. In this video, we'll see how a nation thought devastated by war with Germany smashed the ambitions of Imperial Japan while simultaneously moving into a position capable of threatening the home islands themselves. During the Second World War, the Soviet Union struggled with many strategic problems, and Russian officers had to learn many harsh lessons before they gained the upper hand against the Axis forces. Fortunately, the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare, gives you the chance to take advantage of thousands of inspiring creative classes dictated by various industry professionals. Skillshare has played an instrumental part in my own journey on YouTube. I was taking classes on how to optimize my growth on the platform and establish my brand to a wider audience. The knowledge from these lessons were crucial in helping me maintain my creative output and manage the team that brings you quality content on a consistent basis. If you'd like your own primer on this topic, I'd recommend lessons like YouTube Success, Script, Shoot, and Edit with MKBHD created by Marcus Brownlee. As a bonus, the first 1,000 viewers to sign up using the link in the description below will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Ever since the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1939, tensions between the Empire of the Rising Sun and proletarian dictatorship of Soviet Russia had been high. They had been high in 1939 and then again a little bit later. 
they had several skirmishes um, on the border between the USSR and Japan. And what the Japanese took away from that was, oh my god, we're going to get our shit rocked by the Soviets. Um, and that's why later, um, when Germany was at war with the Soviets, the Japanese actually signed a non-aggression pact with the Soviets because they remembered that the, the border skirmishes, they really actually did get their shit rocked. Um, and this is why Japan never actually came into the war with the Soviets. Uh, went to war with the Soviets while Germany was. If the, if the Axis was actually going to work one time together, it would have been with the Soviets, and they didn't. Because Japan thought they couldn't take on the Soviets. So. Stalin was all too aware of Russia's stinging loss to Japan in 1904, and the image-obsessed autocrat was keen to reauthor the narrative. Border clashes between the two nations had been exceptionally common, with patrolling squads of Japanese and Soviet troops frequently opening fire on each other or conducting small-scale border raids that resulted in dozens of casualties on both sides. Additionally, Soviet Russia had been a major source of military aid for Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang, offering the beleaguered government nearly ten times the resources of other sympathetic powers, such as the United States. And that's something that's not really talked about, because again, the Soviets had a direct land border with uh, Chiang Kai-shek's government in China at this time, and also Mao Zedong, um, that they also supported against the Japanese, because we could really couldn't get fucking supplies. Even in 44 and 45, again, we really still couldn't get supplies to China, so. So great was Stalin's hatred of the Japanese that he was willing to overlook the Kuomintang's mass slaughter of Chinese communists so long as they continued to offer military resistance to their occupiers. The only thing that kept the war from breaking out between the two powers was their preoccupation with other matters. For the Russians, Operation Barbarossa posed a far greater existential threat to Soviet power than even the millions of Japanese troops stationed on the USSR's Manchurian border. The Japanese were rabid anti-communists, and logic dictated it was only a matter of time before the Empire would strike. Yeah, the Japanese Union attack was coming to the Soviets, not renewing the Soviet-Japanese neutrality pact in 1941. However, they were convinced the USSR wouldn't attack for months due to misunderstanding the size and the buildup of their border. Yeah, they were convinced the USSR attack wouldn't happen, so... For the Japanese, it was the ongoing war with America, whose oil embargo threatened to cripple the Japanese economy and stall any further expansion into Central Asia and beyond. Thus, the two natural enemies spent most of the war standing back to back, unable to do more than glance threateningly over their shoulders at each other while they dealt with Nazi expansion and Allied resistance, respectively. And they also have to remember is Japan, they signed the pact earlier, before they went to war with the United States. Um, and there basically was two plans, you can either go north and attack the Soviets, or you can go south and secure the resources. They chose the South option, which was what the Navy was suggesting. The Army was suggesting they actually go into uh, the Soviet Union and attack them. But they didn't agree, and um, the Army said, we can take the Soviets by themselves. Probably not going to fucking happen. Um, but that was the thinking, at least. So they went with the Navy option, which was basically go South, take the resources. And then once they have taken the resources and they're at war with basically everyone but the Soviets, they don't actually want to declare war on the Soviets, because that would be stupid. The first signs of inevitable confrontation emerged in November 1943 at the Tehran Conference. With the war now clearly turning in the favor of the Allies, Joseph Stalin formally pledged to turn his attention eastward as soon as Germany was defeated. By 1944, he had already appointed Marshal Alexander Veselsky as Commander-in-Chief of Soviet forces in the Far East, and tasked the veteran staff officer with drawing up plans for an invasion of Manchuria. At the Yalta Conference in 1945, Stalin reaffirmed his commitment to the war in the East while simultaneously managing to wrestle U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt into agreeing with his plans to restore the territories lost by Tsarist Russia during the Russo-Japanese War. That would require him to get back Port Arthur, which, fun fact, didn't happen. Um, but they had to set up a puppet state. Huh, interesting. 
with his mission to avenge this black stain on Russian honor granted international approval, Stalin headed back to Moscow and demanded that the perpetually beleaguered Soviet High Command, or Stavka, drag its attention away from the advance on Berlin and confront the daunting task of invading 1.5 million square kilometers of virtually undeveloped wilderness on the opposite side of the country. Yeah, so as a staff officer, that's a fucking nightmare. He just, you know, this, yeah, he gives a good example of this. So on this board, on the background, yeah. So let's just say this is Moscow, which maybe it is. But yeah, you have to get all the, the Trans-Siberian Railway. You got to get these, all these troops all the fucking way across, all the way back to the other side of your country. Get them prepared. Get them battle orders. Get them supplies. Get them everything ready to go and then go to attack Japan. Um, Mussolini thought he could do this with Albania and uh, worked on Albania, didn't work with fucking Greece. So yeah, it's not exactly easy. On the opposite side of the country. Fortunately, by this point, Stalin had accepted that competency in his officer corps was not the inevitable precursor to treason. Okay, so yeah, what he's talking about here is basically Stalin stopped fucking shooting his own people. He stopped shooting all of his, well... The Great Purge happened before World War II, but when you have a whole bunch of captains commanding like regiments, it's not going to go very well because they lost all their high-ranking leaders. Anyway, long story short, after fighting the war for four years, um, a lot of the officers actually got pretty good. So this wasn't that bad, but it's still pretty nightmare supply challenge-wise. And Marshal Vasilevsky quickly began putting together plans for an audacious multi-pronged assault. Vasilevsky possessed a keen eye for logistics and operational planning, and, and he, he quickly- That is what is most important, especially if you're fighting this far out east of logistics and administration. You can be a tactical fucking genius, and this, you will die out here. You must be a very masterful and skillful log logistician to make this work. He began assembling a force of hand-picked units known for their experience fighting in difficult terrain. That also helps. If you have very good guys in mountain... So, for example, the United States has 10th Mountain Division. Uh, their experience in fighting in rugged terrain was, you know, difficult supply issues. They're a lot better units to use out here. Even as the Third Reich crumbled under an endless tide of Soviet aggression, the Trans-Siberian Railroad was abuzz with frenzied activity. Dozens of locomotives ferrying tens of thousands of men into staging areas in the Mongolian People's Republic and Primorsky Administrative Region. Vasilevsky also understood the vital role that military intelligence would play in this enormous operation, and carefully supervised the railroad deployments to confuse any Japanese spies operating in the region. While it was impossible to hide the buildup completely, the Stavka worked hard to downplay the sheer size of the force under the marshal's command. That's also very key. So he's good at admin, he's good at logistics, and he's good at deceiving his enemy. These are all the traits of a very good field marshal, or, yeah, or general, really. Mechanized divisions eschewed railways whenever possible, driving their vehicles directly to the staging areas by road instead of on the back of train cars, while the trains themselves drove mainly at night or in harsh weather conditions where they were less likely to be spotted. All told, 40 full divisions, over 750,000 men, were transferred to the Far East in just a few weeks. Com that is fucking insane if you really think about it. 750,000 guys transferred on you know, the entire opposite side of your country. Massive country and all ready to go and experience is pretty fucking insane thing when you think about it. Combined with the 40 divisions already stationed on the borders of Manchuria, this amounted to 1.5 million men eager to see if they could make the rising sun set. Yeah, 1.5 million combat soldiers, or 1.5 million people. Again, these numbers are insane when we think about it today. Also, the fact that Soviet divisions are actually a lot smaller than Western divisions, so... While the Soviets were busy with their buildup, Events elsewhere in the world continued to move apace. Germany surrendered on May 8th, while the war in the Pacific reached the Japanese home islands with the Battle of Okinawa. 
Imperial Japan was fully on the defensive, yet the Allies had been stunned by the sheer ferocity of the Imperial Japanese Army, which resisted despite overwhelming odds. Though Japan had offered repeatedly to negotiate, their military government clung on to the idea of retaining their colonial empire and refused unconditional surrender, determined to avoid the unspeakable bloodbath that would certainly result from an invasion of mainland Japan, the United States now prepared to deploy its ultimate weapon, the atomic bomb. Astonishingly enough, the nuclear firestorm that swept over Japan had minimal impact on the invasion of Manchuria. The deadline for the attack had been set months before, and though he was ostensibly still working with the Western Allies, Stalin cared very little about what happened to the home island. Yeah, so we dropped the, the time bombs, right? And he didn't really care, because he again, his idea was to restore what had happened in 1904, which was the, uh, the Japanese-Russian um, or so Soviet... 1904, Japan attacked Russia and Port Arthur, blew all their shit up, took a lot of their shit. Um, and it was a very bad scene on the Russian Empire. Um, so he's always trying to do is get the shit back, and he's not calling this one off. So His goal was to gobble up as much territory and gain as much influence over the final outcome of the war in Asia as possible. Just three days after Hiroshima was reduced to ashes by the first ever atomic airstrike, a Soviet ambassador issued a formal declaration of war to his Japanese counterpart. Precisely one hour and one minute later, a million Soviet troops thundered across the border into Manchuria, catching the Imperial Japanese Army totally by surprise. And you see here, here several, borders, several border conflicts were fought between, you know, on the Soviet Union in 32 and in 39. The battle, biggest battle was Kankingol, Klockingol, if I can say that, with 100,000 soldiers. So yeah, one hour, one minute of the day, we have declared war on you with uh, technically not a surprise attack, but I'm getting in the fucking weeds there. Anyway, so they march over the border, so. Vasilevsky's plan of attack was simple, yet gigantic in scale. His forces were divided across three fronts, the trans Baikal Front, the first Far Eastern Front, and the second Far Eastern Front. Now, I just want to take you a look, because they do a really good job of these maps. I just want you to take a look at how rough terrain this is. Look, look, look at this fucking shit. You got forests and you got mountains on this entire side, or just for the trans, trans Baikal Baki, Front. Far Eastern Front and the second Far Eastern Front. The, the second Far Eastern Front right here is technically plains for a little bit, but is, again, there's not much shit out here. And the first far eastern front, this is where Vladivostok is. This is where your main supply hub can actually be, so you can push it, but before you get to the mountain regions and stuff. Together, they formed a massive pincer movement that aimed to completely encircle Japanese forces in the puppet state of Manchukuo with one overwhelming charge. And again, it makes sense, right? You're gonna push this side and this side to get them pincered. And the second front is going to be basically just pushing them forward. So if you can cut them off and you capture or kill everyone here, yeah, their armies are gone. Although caught by surprise and substantially outgunned, the Japanese Kuantang army stationed in Manchuria had no intention of simply rolling over and giving up. Sources conflict on their exact size in 1945, but at a minimum, General Otozo Yamada had 800,000 men under his command and could call up another few hundred thousand in reserve from Manchukuo and Mengjiang. Which is, when in numbers are, these numbers are insane when you think about it. Because again, the United States just was starting to bomb the home islands with the atomic weapons now. And they still had over, if they called up all the reserves, another million men in Manchukuo um, to fight on a border so again not all these soldiers are very good let's be very honest here the soldiers that are in manchuko are second line or reserve soldiers all the good ones were fighting in the pacific they're all dead now so now there's basically just anybody left the Kuantang army was also considered an elite fighting force, having spent years on campaign against the Chinese and local insurrections. Unfortunately, it had been all but bled dry by the demands of the Pacific War, with many of its veteran units siphoned off to fight against the United States during their island-hopping campaigns. Given this unenviable situation, the Japanese had embraced the concept of defense in depth leaving the borders of Manchuria lightly defended and concentrating their troops along strategic choke points and natural strongholds. 
Yeah, so defense in depth is basically instead of defending a rigid position, this is what they were learned after World War One. Instead of defending a rigid position, you need to have flexibility in your lines. So defense in depth is like you expect your first line to get broken and it breaks away. And then you the the amount of depth, so it's like how many lines of successive you have behind it are able to stop a force in theory. And they're also defending strategic objectives on hillsides rather than a point on a map. As a result of this approach, the initial Soviet charge was practically unopposed. Vasilevsky had chosen his men well, and whole divisions were able to cross the difficult border terrain with ease. Yeah, and it makes sense, because um, they're not fucking planning it happen. Also, this man has two Hero of the Soviet Union um, awards, which is basically, for us Americans, two Medal of Honor. On the trans bagel front, the 6th Guard Army penetrated through areas the Japanese themselves had deemed impassable, such as the Greater Kingan Mountain Range. For I love the saying, people say that it, they thought it was impossible. At this point, they really have no reason, rhyme, to think anything is impossible at this point. Ardennes happened not once, but twice now. <laughs> With You can basically penetrate everything that you think is impenetrable, more or less. Further west, a Soviet Mongolian cavalry mechanized corps charged straight into the puppet state of Mengjiang, aiming to cross the vast Mongolian desert and seize the trade city of Kalgan. And cavalry again was still being used at this point. And cavalry is actually a bit more effective out here in the east, this far east, just because supplies is so low that you can actually, horses for mobility wise aren't that bad of an option. Just, I mean, again, mechanized would be better, but. If you can't get oil, they don't go anywhere. Horses can still keep going. Finally, on the second Far Eastern Front, Soviet forces pushed across the border and pinned the local Japanese soldiers in place, preventing them from withdrawing south to the capital city of Shangchun. Overall, the advance was incredibly rapid, exceeding Soviet expectations. With the first major obstacle only encountered when Russian troops pressed into the Halar district of Inner Mongolia. After crossing the- Yes, yeah, so it was one of the few railway hubs linking Manchuria with the Soviet Union and Japanese plan had assumed would be the primary target of attack. Yeah, maybe not been the primary plan of attack, going for it immediately, but again, yeah, the railway hubs are very important. Argon River, using amphibious vehicles, the Soviets found themselves engaged by a Japanese division supported by a large force of Manchurian cavalry. Though unable to halt the enemy advance, the Japanese quickly formed a strong pocket of resistance centered around the regional capital, which housed a massive underground fortress built by Chinese slave labor in 1937. Yeah, and I want you to think about this. These, these units that are fighting, these are the best some of the best of the units, the Russian, the Soviets have. Some of the elite units, so their guards units, very experienced. Okay, they're fighting secondhand troops, and also these tanks out here are very fucking good because the Japanese have zero tanks here. Um, all their tanks are gone, or they're dog shit compared to everything the Soviets are going to be bringing with their air power and their tanks. But yeah, tanks. When you fight an enemy that has no tanks and you have tanks, makes a really significant advantage. Also, the fact that the guys had. SMG squads and SMG uh, battalions um, for assaulting, which is what the Soviets had, and Japan had nothing. Again, not the real fault of Japan, but because they don't have any resources at this point. Also, the fact that this is 1945 we're talking about, so. As night fell, the Soviets launched an armored assault into the suburbs, only to be driven back by hidden anti-tank guns and kamikaze troops who rushed their vehicles wielding explosive charges. The sheer willingness of the Japanese to engage superior forces with an utter disregard for their own lives was shocking to even men hardened by the Eastern Front. And yeah, and that, I mean, again, because the Eastern Front was its own fucking war, but even this is like insane to them. Uh, yeah. The decision was quickly made to besiege Halar while the rest of the army continued advancing across the mountains. 24 hours into the invasion, Soviet forces had made huge gains across the fronts, leaving the Kwantung army in total chaos. The 6th Guards Army had sped over the Greater Kingan Mountains, plunging into the central Manchurian plains that held the majority of the population. The Japanese had barely organized a token resistance, and many field commanders had lost contact with headquarters. Then, the worst news of all arrived. 
Just a few hours after the Soviet declaration of war, the city of Nagasaki had been erased from the earth by an atomic fireball even larger than the one which had engulfed Hiroshima. These two events crippled the ability of the Japanese government to respond to the lightning assault ripping through Manchuria. Yeah, what's happening in Japan right now is absolutely utter chaos. Um, the Emperor is a good movie for, well, it's really after World War II, but there are some scenes in it that relate back to this event. But basically, the army is more or less trying to mutiny and the against the Emperor the government is absolutely in shambles right now. Um, so yeah, the ability to respond is basically non-existent. It's up to the guys in the field to basically hold on. Between the 10th and the 12th of August, the Soviet advance continued well ahead of schedule, with two significant exceptions. On the first Far Eastern Front, two Russian armies totaling nearly 300,000 men crashed into the 55,000 strong Japanese 5th Army around the city of Mutin Chang. Though often described as the only set-piece battle of the whole invasion, the Battle of Mutin Chang was in fact a desperate holding action fought while the bulk of the Japanese Far Eastern forces retreated south. Japanese defenses were concentrated on a series of fortified hilltops, which allowed them to pour artillery fire down on the advancing enemy columns. Heavy rain also bogged down Russian tanks, allowing them to be swamped by Japanese suicide bombers. Casualties quickly mounted on both sides, but the Japanese continued to put up a frenzied resistance, successfully stalling the Russian advance for several days. The second major holdup occurred when Soviet troops assaulted the Karafto Line on the Sakhalin Island, which had been designated as a vital staging area for a potential future invasion of Hokkaido. And up here in the, the Saka Islands, uh, right here, suddenly there's some oil up here too, so invasion of Hokkaido. Though outnumbered almost 4 to 1, the 20,000 defenders were dug in and heavily fortified, necessitating a series of amphibious assaults by the Soviet Navy to pry them loose from their static defenses. Unfortunately for the... Now, the thing with the Soviet Navy, these are Soviet Marines that are going to be doing it. Again, you don't really think of the Soviet Navy as being good. Really didn't fucking really participate in World War II besides convoy escorting. But some of these Marines units are actually pretty experienced because they did fight in Leningrad and Stalingrad because Marine units were, were actually fighting during World War II. They weren't just sitting the fuck around doing nothing. Unfortunately for the Japanese army, Mutenchang and Karafto were single strong points in a region undergoing rapid collapse. Back on the trans bakel front, the 6th Guard Army had been forced to halt between the 12th and 13th due to a lack of fuel, but was now charging straight towards its main objectives at Mukden and Changchun. Yeah, so they're trying to cut them off. It makes sense. You see, this is this pocket can be encircled very easily. Anybody who played Hoi Fork, you know what the fuck are doing. Basically, if you take Muaduk and Chukten, or Chuk Chui, I think, um, and take these rail lines, you cut everyone off up here, and then they're fucked. Um, and pushing down to take these, you're basically fighting over cities at this point. Fit cities and towns and major rail hub locations. Charging straight towards its main objectives at Mukden and Changchun. The corps in Mengzhang had also reached Kalgan after hard fighting with local Mongolian cavalry, and would go on to dismantle the regime with minimal resistance over the next few weeks. The Far Eastern fronts saw significant gains as well, when an amphibious assault launched from Vladivostok successfully captured the Korean city of Shangjin on the 13th. However, the most devastating blow to Japanese morale came on the 14th, when Prince Tsunyoshi Takeda arrived in Manchuria and demanded the Imperial Japanese Army cease fire. General Yamada immediately countermanded this order, causing a major split among his officer corps as men were torn between their loyalty to the Emperor and determination to fight to the death. Yes, and this is going on in Japan. This isn't talked about nearly enough. This is also going on in Japan because the emperor at this point, from what we know, was wanting the entire was wanting to surrender because Nagasaki uh, happened just happened. Um, and that's that's it. That's the second bomb. Second city wiped out. And he wanted to surrender. The army was not having it. The army wanted to go down in a blaze of glory and take everyone with them. 
Um, so again, they tried to actually kill their own emperor. Um, his royal guard fought them off semi-successfully, and then another military unit that was loyal to the emperor came in, shot the traitors, and then that leader shot himself for what he had done for his dishonor to the army and what they were doing. Um, and again, this prince is like, hey, you need to stop. Like, this needs to have a ceasefire. And the army is not, so the officer loyalties are going to go everywhere at this point. The confusion only worsened a day later when Emperor Hirohito made a broadcast implying but never outright stating that a surrender was taking place. All the while... Yes, yeah, so this is true. He never specifically said... It's wholly Japanese culture. Regardless of the fact that it is Japanese culture, he did not say the words, we are surrendering. That never came out of his mouth. He implied it. In a very roundabout way for Japanese culture that they would understand it, but everyone else didn't. And it wasn't such a direct initiative that you could challenge an officer being like, hey, no, you just stop because our emperor just said we are surrendering. It's not like that. It's just implied that it was happening. And some Japanese thought it was that. It's a whole mess. But the words were surrender were never uttered. Marshal Vasilevsky pushed his men onwards, desperate to gobble up as much territory as possible before the Japanese could officially capitulate. On the 16th, the Soviets launched an all-out assault on Butenchan, engaging the defenders in brutal room-to-room -room combat as massed Katyusha rocket artillery systematically annihilated the remaining hill forts. Having been cut off from all communications for days, the defenders stubbornly fought to the last man, inflicting over 10,000 casualties on the Russian aggressors before the city fell. Their sacrifice had been brave, but it was ultimately a futile gesture, as the bulk of the Japanese army would simply lay down its arms in accordance with the surrender only two days later on the 19th. This was the same day the defenders of the massive fortress complex at Helar surrendered, having been whittled down to fewer than 4,000 men after a 10-day siege. The only remaining strong point was the Karafato line, whose defenders unanimously rejected the surrender order. Yeah, and you reject the, you reject the surrender order, that's it. You're, you're breaking literally every law <laughs> possible at this point. You're, you're basically... With their advance now proceeding more or less unopposed, the Soviets began to uncover some of the darker secrets of Manchuria. Upon reaching the large city of Harbin on the 20th, the men of the 1st Red Banner Army discovered the infamous Unit 731 busily trying to destroy all evidence of its nightmarish biological weapons program. Yeah, Unit 731, all those members should have been shot and executed. I stand by that statement. That's not what happened. The cruelty that happened there look, makes the fucking extermination cams look like fucking baby play. I'll be very honest with you. What that unit did was horrific. Um, I'm not going to share what they did. You can look up Unit 731 on your own. Um, but it's really fucking sickening that the United States pardoned every single one of them because they wanted their research after this happened. They also discovered the mass graves of murdered Chinese civilians, and even Japanese civilians who had been executed by the retreating IGA in order to save them from the indignity of having to surrender. And again, this is mind-boggling for us in the West to kill your own people because they have to surrender. But the Soviets had very little mercy of their own, and cities like Shangshun and Harbin were subjected to days of looting and burning. Although the official capitulation of the exhausted Kwantung army occurred on the 19th, the Soviets would continue offensive operations until early September. When the train lines ran out, they used trucks and horses. When the supply depots were out of range, they used airdrops. Under Vasilevsky's leadership, the Red Army stretched its supply lines further than anyone had previously considered possible, pushing from the borders of Mongolia all the way to the Korean Peninsula in less than three weeks. Sakhalin Island would fall on the 25th, and a series of amphibious assaults on the Kuril Islands would only end when Japanese ambassadors arrived in Soviet territory to declare unconditional surrender of the entire nation. Which makes sense, but at that point, unconditional surrender means you can do whatever the fuck you want, really. 
Though modern historians continue to debate whether the atomic bombs or the invasion of Manchuria contributed most to the Japanese surrender, the Soviet contribution should not be underestimated. By the time their offensive ended, all of Japan's mainland territories had been wiped out, and over 2.7 million Japanese citizens had been captured. Russian casualties have been heavily debated, but a generally accepted figure is around 24,000. Which is fucking nothing compared to what they inflicted. Vasilevsky's logistical genius had delivered Stalin a victory that Tsarist Russia could only have dreamed of, restoring all of the territory lost in 1905 and granting Russia unparalleled influence in Asia. This would have huge implications for the coming Cold War. And it would for many decades to come, even yeah, I mean, the day with China. Anyway, so hope you guys liked that video. I think it's a very well put together video. Um, it's also on a subject that's not really talked about much at all and is a very important last little bit to understand why Japan actually surrendered. Again, my belief is they weren't going to, the two bombs were rocking them really badly, but again, it was, in my opinion, is this invasion that really tipped them over the edge of like, we need to surrender now because it's not going to be good if we're occupied by the Soviets. So hope you liked that video. Leave a like if you did, leave your comments below. Otherwise, I'll see you people next time.